Today, we're going to continue our series on the history of medieval science by covering the subject of medieval astronomy. I'm following history, and in this video, we will leave the historical context of the early and high middle ages, and instead cover the actual discussions about the workings of nature during the medieval era. Stay tuned. The view of the cosmos by medieval thinkers changed over time in several aspects depending on what ancient astronomical literature that were available. The core theory in medieval astronomy, which had been the consensus among astronomers since the days of Plato and Aristotle, is that the cosmos is a sphere with a stationary earth in the center and the stars and planets circling around it. For most of the early middle ages, and a bit into the 12th century, the cosmos was thought of as an homogeneous being, made up of one single substance, governed by a world soul, and held together by astrological forces. This view of the cosmos was heavily influenced by the thinking of Plato, since his work called Timaeus was some of the only astronomical literature in medieval Europe, up to the 12th century renaissance. As the works of Aristotle started to be rediscovered, the Aristotelian view of the cosmos would gradually displace Plato's cosmology on points where the two philosophers disagreed. The main reason Aristotle's thought had such an impact was not due to the medieval scholars feeling compelled to yield to Aristotle's authority, but rather that his cosmological picture as a whole offered a more persuasive and satisfying account of the world as they perceived it. One of the main areas where Aristotle came to influence medieval astronomy is in the rejection of the homogeneous view of the universe, in favor of a universe divided into two spheres called the terrestrial sphere and the celestial sphere. The terrestrial sphere lies below the moon and is constituted of the four elements, earth, water, air and fire, and is characterized by change, corruption and generation. The celestial sphere on the other hand is constituted of a single fifth element called the ether, and is characterized by unchanging perfection and circular motion. Outside the universe, Aristotle thought that nothing could exist. No matter, no space, nor time or place. The celestial sphere itself is divided into eight different spheres, one for each of the seven known planets, and one eighth sphere which is the sphere of the fixed stars. The cause of the planet's motion in each sphere lies in what Aristotle called its natural motion. In order to understand what natural motion is, we must first cover Aristotle's two ideas of motion. According to Aristotle, an object is moved either by its natural motion or by forced motion. Natural motion refers to an object's tendency to move towards its natural place in the universe, while force motion refers to an object being caused to move by an external object. The natural motion of the planets is caused by what Aristotle called the prime mover, a sort of divine being representing the highest good, being non-spatial and absorbed in self-contemplation. This being don't affect the motion of the planets as an efficient cause, but as a changeless final cause, which the planets strive to imitate by assuming uniform circular motion. Now, for unknown reasons, Aristotle decided not only to posit one unmoved mover, but several, one for the motion of each planet. This Aristotelian view of the cosmos were in large part incorporated into the medieval cosmology, but many medieval thinkers saw issues with several aspects of it. One of the issues many saw was concerning the idea that nothing could exist outside the universe, with several thinkers criticizing the idea using an old thought experiment that is first known to have been used by an ancient Stoic philosopher. Imagine you're standing at the edge of the periphery of the universe, and are stretching out your arm towards the edge. The arm would either hit a wall, which would be something, or enter into empty space, which also would be something, from which it follows that the idea of an absolute nothing existing outside the universe is impossible. Another issue that many medieval thinkers had with the idea was that it contradicted God's omnipotence. 
If God is omnipotent, he would be able to create as many worlds as he pleased. But if he created more than one world, there would be void space between them, which is something existing outside the universe and therefore impossible in the Aristotelian cosmology. The way most medieval thinkers solved this problem was with a trade-off, where they acknowledged that God hypothetically could create many worlds, but that he didn't have reason to do so, in which it would follow that Aristotle's ideas still could be considered technically true. However, other thinkers like Thomas Bradwire and Nicholas Oresmi argued that God had in fact created things outside the universe, claiming that there existed an infinite amount of void space outside the cosmos, which they identified with God's omnipresence. Another issue that the medieval scholars also saw in the Aristotelian cosmology was regarding the nature of the unmoved movers. According to Aristotle, the prime mover is the vine, and the highest being, which meant that it was often identified with the Christian god in medieval Europe. However, what about the other, lesser, unmoved movers? If the prime mover is considered the vine, it would imply that the other unmoved movers were minor deities, but acknowledging the existence of minor deities besides the creator would be heresy. One way that some medieval thinkers tried to solve this was by identifying them as angels, which means that they are intelligences without bodies. Other thinkers, however, decided to explain the motion of the planets by doing away with the unmoved movers altogether. This can be seen in the works of the English Archbishop Kilwardby and the Parisian scholar John Buridan. According to Kilwardby, the planets moved due to an innate tendency to move in a circular motion. Burden elaborated upon Kilwardby's idea and proposed that the cause of a planet's motion is an impetus, which was given to it when God created the universe and set the planets in motion. The impetus refers to an object maintaining its motion after it's been set in motion, until being arrested by opposing forces such as air resistance. Burden is a medieval thinker which we will come back to several times in this series, and his theory of the impetus, while not being identical, is not too far from Newton's theories of inertia and momentum, and an important step in laying the groundwork for the scientific revolution a couple of centuries later. When it came to astronomy, Burden not only studied the movements of the heavens, but also asked whether the Earth itself could be said to be moving. Geocentrism had been a consensus in astronomy since antiquity, and while more or less all medieval scholars agreed upon this idea, some thinkers like Burden decided to explore the arguments for whether the Earth could be said to be rotating on its axle. The idea that the Earth rotated did not have much evidence supporting it in the Middle Ages, and seemed to contradict common sense and how scholars observed the universe. To counter this notion, Burden pointed out that astronomers don't observe absolute motion, but relative motion, and that the question of whether the Earth rotated could therefore not be answered by astronomical observations, but must depend on physical arguments. One famous argument that Burden came up with was the arrow experiment. This experiment refers to that when an arrow is shot straight up into the sky on a windless day, it tends to land on the same spot as it was shot from, implying that the Earth did not rotate which Burden took as conclusive evidence that the Earth is stationary. However, Burden's student and later bishop of Lisieux, Nicolas Oresmi, would later refute Burden's error experiment by arguing that an arrow shot straight up in the air would also accompany the earth in its rotation. The arrow would therefore remain above the point of the earth from which it was shot, and eventually return to its starting point. Oresmi would reinforce this argument with a shipboard thought experiment, similar to the one that Galileo would use in the 17th century, and he also made a positive case for the rotation of the Earth, by pointing out the economical advantage that the theory had by being able to explain many astronomical observations with one single slow motion rather than many fast ones. However, in the end, Oresmi would remain convinced in Aristotle's idea that the Earth was stationary. The arguments represented the best philosophical case of his day for the motion of the Earth, and would be an important step in laying the foundations for the Copernican Revolution in the 16th century. 
But at the time, the idea that the Earth was stationary still had a more convincing case, and will continue to have that for a couple more centuries. Today, I hope you enjoyed this medieval science documentary, as well as learn something new about science in the medieval period. And don't forget that if you like this video and want to see more videos like it, hit the like, share and subscribe buttons.